Good evening. My purpose this evening is just to make a few comments on the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the first in a series of five films on each of the first five steps. We begin, obviously, with number one. I think it is true to say that the thing that is hardest to grasp is the obvious. As somebody once said, I can't see the woods because the trees are in the way. And so often that happens to us, to everybody. We fail to grasp the obvious. You see written up here the words of the very first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. No one who has a drinking problem is about to take on himself a regime of life that forbids the use of alcohol until and unless he admits that continuing to drink it will kill him. And so we come to the first step. And as someone once said, in commenting on the obvious, the longest journey begins with the first step. And usually the first step is the hardest, the most difficult. It's like the first step of a ladder. It's the highest and the widest, but it's the strongest. And somebody once said, and I agree with this, the depth and the seriousness with which you will work the rest of this program depends directly on the depth and the seriousness with which you accept this. This is not just a step you take and then you go on from there. This is an admission of one's condition. It's not just an intellectual thing after you, uh, you hear a whole lot of facts and you get a whole lot of intellectual data from lectures and films and meetings and groups and individual therapy and everything, you can come to the conclusion intellectually, well, yes, I guess I'm an alcoholic. This step is down here. I am an alcoholic. And it only comes when we have a lovely meeting of these ingredients. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And so this is the how of recovery. How do I get well? How do I get rid of this hell that I'm in? How do I get out of the pit that I find myself at the bottom of? How? through a basic honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And if you have those ingredients, you can indeed get well. And it begins here. It begins here. In 1935, two men sat down at a kitchen table. One had six months of sobriety, one had about six hours. They were perfectly intelligent men. They were not screwballs, they were not fanatics. One was a stockbroker, one was a physician, a surgeon. They had tried everything to get out of the hell that they were in. One man gained his six months of sobriety by trying to help other people get sober. He hadn't helped anyone, but he had helped himself by trying to help the others. He found out that the technique he was using to help them wasn't working simply because it wasn't valid. It wasn't valid because it wasn't working. He was trying to hammer nails with milk bottles, and the milk bottles kept breaking. You can only hammer nails when you have a hammer. And he was searching for the hammer, and he couldn't put a handle on it. You know what he was using to help them? He said, get right with God, and your drinking problem you'll be able to handle. He didn't know that you had to get rid of the drinking problem in order to get right with God. So like so many things in AA, he learned through trial and error. His doctor, Dr. Silkworth, told him, the next alcoholic you talk to, why don't you use a scientific approach? Maybe something's wrong with us alcoholics. Our bodies can't handle alcohol normally. And that was the approach that he used to this scientific man, this physician, and it made sense. Have you tried this? Yes. Have you tried that? Yes. Have you tried the other thing? Yes. You're still drinking? Yes. Maybe something's wrong with us. In desperation, they were seeking an answer to that which was killing them. They were not theoricians. They didn't have any theories about how to get well. They just wanted to survive. 
And so they figured this. Let's just wipe the slate clean. They got rid of everything they had been trying before. They tried to wipe their mind, minds clean so that they began now, at this point when they had met each other, with the mind being a, as Plato used to say, the human mind at birth is a tabula rasa, a clean slate on which experience and life does the writing. And this is the way they started. We had better admit that we cannot handle this problem. That's the way they started to get well. How can you get well unless you admit you're sick? And that's what they did. They surrendered to a fact that no addict, whether it's addiction to alcohol or any other chemical, wants to admit, and that is that he or she is powerless over anything. But they had to come to that point if they wanted to survive. They were too close to death. They were too close to death. I think Bill Wilson realized at that moment of his life, he had another drunk left. He just didn't know if he had another survival left, and he wanted to survive. And so he admitted a powerlessness over alcohol. That's a horrible thing to ask any human being to do, is to admit he's powerless over anything. And yet he had to surrender to win the war. That is the great paradox of recovery. We surrender in order to gain victory. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you know what it boils down to? Alcoholics and drug addicts are perfectly intelli otherwise intelligent men and women. This is the comparison I always use. They climb into a boxing ring every day of their lives with a champion and get beat up. And they keep getting into the ring. Sixteen years they get out of bed all black and blue, crawling along the floor, heading for the ring. Guess what's going through the little BB shot that they call a brain? How can I not get beat up today? <laughs> While they're putting the gloves on. AA leans over their shoulder. And, now listen to what AA says. Don't get in the ring. <laughs> if you don't fight, you don't get beat. AA says if you don't take a drink, you can't get drunk. The obvious the obvious. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Begins here. If I can't win, what sense does it make to fight? And so step one is an acknowledgement of one's condition. And in my opinion, it is something that you keep inside your heart as well as your mind. You keep it inside your heart as you would keep a sobriety token in your pocket. You finger it often. And you finger with the fingers of your heart and your mind and your soul this thought here. I, I am powerless over alcohol. It's a deepening of a conviction. And the deeper that conviction is in your soul, the more seriously will you work the other 11 steps of the AA program. This is the first step in the ladder out of the pit of alcoholism or drug addiction. Give in or cave in. It's one or the other. Now, how do I come to this admission? Through honesty. <laughs> Through honesty. I once heard a man say to his patients, look at the record. Look at the record Look at your record. If you come up with this, when I drank, I didn't control it, it controlled me. And my drinking made problems. What makes problems is one. And if your drinking makes problems, that's a drinking problem. I don't care what you call it, as long as you realize, if this thing that I am doing is making trouble, it is. That is so self-evident, nobody can prove it. You either see it or you don't. You either see it or you don't. I always use this. Let's just answer a few simple questions. Have you ever in your life, ever, drunk more than you determined you were going to drink? I'm not talking about the fellow who every Friday 
gets his paycheck cashed at the local tavern, drinks two beers. Every now and then an old friend shows up and he drinks four. I'm not talking about that. I'm asking you if you have ever drunk more than you determined you were going to drink. I know, honey, I made a jackass of myself at the last party. I swear on my sainted mother's grave, no more than three, and you drink 23. Have you ever in your entire life drunk more than you determined you were going to drink? Have you ever promised yourself not to drink more than a certain amount and gone beyond it? If your answer is yes once, you're probably an alcoholic, and if it's twice, sign up. <laughs> answer this when it's easy. Have you ever lied about your drinking? Yes or no? Quit piddling around. Yes or no? If your answer is yes, you're in. I use one question to diagnose the disease. Look at the behavior you're considering and answer this question. Do normal drinkers do this? Question, do normal drinkers lie about their drinking? Answer, they have absolutely no reason to. How many of you got here for good behavior? <laughs> God. How many of you made it here for being wife of the year? Oh, honey, there's no one on earth like you. You're the perfect wife. Let's get you into treatment. <laughs> do you, honestly, do, do you see what I'm doing? I am kicking the daylights out of the obvious. Did you ever hide a bottle? Normal people don't do that. Did you ever hide one from yourself? Did you ever find it after you're sober six years? What good is it then? I'm kicking the daylights out of the obvious. Now watch this. Hey, don't tell me why my life was unmanageable. I haven't lost a family. I haven't lost a wife. I haven't lost a job. I still have two cars in the house. What he's not considering is you haven't lost them yet. If there are any of you in this room who have a litany of the nevers, Somebody once said, keep drinking, all those good things will happen to you. But you don't have to, you've already proven to yourself hundreds of times the facts. Your drinking is causing trouble in your life. Yes, you still have your wife, but your marriage is dangling by a thread. One time a friend of mine had a patient walk in to him and he said, I don't belong here. I've been here for a week, I've listened to everything you have to offer. I just don't think I belong here. And he went through this whole litany of nevers that everybody else is talking about. And when he finished... The boss of the place said, you've just told me all the things that alcohol has not done to you. Let's not talk about them. Let's talk about what it has done. It brought you here, didn't it? And then he took off from there. Unmanageable. The noblest faculty the human animal has is his mind. It's what makes him godlike. Alcohol occupies 90% of the active drinker's waking thought. Alcohol or drugs controlled the people you associated with and those you stayed away from. Alcohol and drugs determined the places you went and the places you avoided. Alcohol determined the very restaurants you went into and those you stayed away from. Life manageable? Let's be open-minded to truth and willing to do something about it. My friends, alcoholism and drug addiction are terminal illnesses. Doesn't it make sense for a normal human being who has it pointed out to him, there are certain signs, why don't you check them out? Doesn't it make sense to check them out? When you discuss what we've just gone over afterwards, bring some honesty and open-mindedness to the discussion and bring a little willingness to do what needs to be done. Remember, if the alcoholic doesn't stop the drinking, the drinking will ultimately stop him. And for your sakes, I hope you stop the drinking first. Thank you.